Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series entitled Christian Philosophy Part 2. And of course this is a follow-up to Part 1, which was talking about the way you think, a worldview, and we dealt with basically theological issues about how that the Word of God is uh, truly the Word of God. It's absolute. It's inerrant. And how that God needs to be absolute Lord over you. God is a good God. I dealt with a lot of things like that. This week I've been talking about a Christian philosophy or a Christian worldview towards social issues such as, and we've been talking about homosexuality this week. The first two days I just spent establishing my right to say this. There's so many people that have a philosophy that you can't say anything, you can't do these things, and they are so afraid of being politically incorrect. And I spent a couple of days establishing that, and then I spent a couple of days where I've just gone through the scriptures. I've taken every scripture in the Bible that talks against homosexuality and showed you that this is God's viewpoint on the issue. And it amazes me. I mean, I am, I am really perplexed, and I do not have an answer for how some people can claim to be Christians and love God and believe in the Bible and still embrace and promote homosexuality. Now, I can understand and I actually advocate a Christian being uh, merciful and kind and loving towards a homosexual. I don't think that you ought to be condemning but you don't have to sit there and promote that lifestyle in order to show love towards those people. You can love a person who's doing something wrong and yet tell them that what they're doing is wrong. And I've shared a bunch of scriptures on that. Today what I want to do, and I, I've said this earlier in the week, but there's a lot of people that they just don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. And there's a lot of people that the moment you start using the Bible as your basis of, of your belief system, they just discount you as you're irrelevant. This doesn't count. Well, really, I have no uh, need to go beyond the Bible. To me, that's everything. The Word of God has changed my life. Man, the Lord has used His Word in my life in a supernatural way, so I don't really need anything else. But for those of you who the Bible isn't sufficient or you think that it's outdated or that it doesn't apply to us. Like, uh, you know, let me just say this. Again, I'm not trying to dish on anybody. I'm just telling you the truth. These are, these are truths that anybody can research and find out for yourself. But President Clinton, the uh, President of the United States for eight years, claimed to be a born-again Christian. And he was outspoken on that. And in a news conference one time, somebody asked him, you claim to be a born-again Christian and you believe in the Bible and yet the Bible speaks against homosexuality and against abortion and against many of the things that he was for. And so they just asked him, how do you reconcile being a born-again Christian with what the Bible teaches on these things? And his answer was, and I can't quote him exactly, but here's the point that he believed that the Bible was just a book about God written by men, and it needed to be interpreted based on our situation. So he didn't believe it was infallible. He believed that it was uh, up for interpretation, and it needed to be updated. And back, you know, thousands of years ago, homosexuality was wrong for whatever reason, but today things have changed. Well, now, see, that's the only way I can understand a person who claims to be a Christian embracing some of these perversions today is for you to just relegate the Bible as being irrelevant. And it doesn't matter what the Bible says, and we are now enlightened, and we've gone beyond the Bible. That's the way that a lot of people view this. But if you claim to believe the Bible, I just don't, I cannot reconcile how Christians who are supposed to be Bible believers can embrace and promote things that are just completely contrary to Scripture. And I don't want to try and understand it. I just think it's wrong. So, for those of you that you know, the Word of God is not enough. Here are some statistics. Even if you were to separate morality and faith and any of these kind of issues from it and just look at this, if, let me challenge you. If you haven't already turned off your television set, let me challenge you to just be honest 
take these statistics, and we're going to give you sources. You can go look this up. You can study it out on your own. These are facts. These are empirical facts. This isn't somebody spinning something. If you were to take these facts and look at this, I do not believe that you could sit there and embrace and promote a homosexual lifestyle because it is so uh, damaging to a person. It is one of the most destructive things that could possibly happen. And that's by statistics, not by faith, not by church standards, not by somebody's standard of morality. This is just the facts. Here are some of these facts. You know, homosexuals love to present themselves as they are just absolutely normal. They're just like everybody else. It's just two men or two women. But other than that, they've got a job, they've got a house, they got a car, they got a dog, they got all of these things. They're just like everybody else. It's just two men or two women instead of a man and a woman together. That is a total misrepresentation. And here's some facts to prove this. There, this uh, group, uh, Bell and Weinberg, A.P. Bell and M.S. Weinberg, uh, produced a book entitled Homosexualities, a Study of Diversity Among Men and Women. And this was a uh, study, of course, on homosexuality. They found that 43% of white male homosexuals had sex with 500 or more partners in their lifetime. And yet they want to present that homosexuality is just being as normal as a heterosexual couple. There was 28% of the white male homosexuals that had had over 1,000 sex partners in a lifetime. Now, even if you are going to sit there and argue that homosexuality is normal and acceptable, this is perversion by anybody's standards. For 43% of the homosexuals to have had 500 or more partners, just take about, talk about this as being heterosexual. What if you looked at a couple and in a lifetime they had had 500 or more sexual partners? I guarantee you anybody's standard. I don't care if you're pagan. I don't care if you're non-Christian. Anybody looks at that and says, this is not good. This is not a healthy environment. There isn't a single um, judge or court system today that if somebody, if you could prove that they had had 500 sexual partners, that you were raising a kid in that environment, there isn't a judge that would say that this is an acceptable norm. This is a perversion by anybody's standards. And yet they're trying to portray themselves as being normal. And yet nearly 50% of them have more than 500 partners in a lifetime. You know, I've got a graph here, and uh, hopefully my uh, television department will put this up. But this graph is showing uh, on the left-hand side is zero up to 90%. And the first uh, column is married females. And 85% of married females claim that they are faithfully, uh, sexually faithful to their mate in a marriage. Out of married males, it's 75.5% of married males claim that they are faithful to their mate. And then you come over here to the homosexuals, and there is 4.5% that claim that they are faithful to their mate. Now, if you're looking at that graph, can you see that there is something here that makes homosexuality in a class all by itself? This claim that they are faithful to their mate is, is not true. They are not normal by anybody's stretch of the imagination. It is a perverted lifestyle, and once you cross that threshold, it leads to promiscuity. It leads to unfaithfulness. There is no such thing as this is just a faithfully committed couple. That's not true. And even if you, uh, if you were to go on and read the rest of this study, I'm not going to go through all of the details, but I've read this study in detail. When they say that they are in a committed relationship, you know what they mean by committed relationship? Among the homosexuals who said that they were committed to their partner, they averaged three to five other sexual encounters per year. So what even they are defining as being committed is not committed at all. I guarantee you among those that are married here, if they knew that their mate was having three to four or five sexual encounters per year, 
they, this would be totally different. So their definition, what they call commitment, is not true at all. Uh, kind of a spinoff of all of this, you'll hear people say that they are pushing for these, uh, oh, I forgot the exact terminology of it, but they're, they're pushing for these uh, relationships to where they are some kind of a legally recognized deal or either where they could be married. You could go to the state of Vermont, and Vermont has legalized homosexual marriage, and um, they estimate the percentage of homosexuals in Vermont based on the amount of percentage, uh, the percentage of homosexuals to the population. Now, the homosexual community will tell you that's anywhere from 10 to 12, 13 percent is what they claim. This statistic that I'm referring to is based on there only being 2 to 3 percent of homosexuality, which most, of homosexuals, which most people believe is more accurate. Homosexuals are claiming a larger influence than what they truly have. And if you were to take the homosexuals' claims, that it was 10 to 12 percent, that would make these stats that I'm about to give you much, much worse. But let's use the conservative thing and say that there's only 2 to 3 percent. So you take the entire population of Vermont, and I don't have these figures in front of me, but I've uh, read all of this. And if you take the population of Vermont, take 2 to 3 percent, and decide that those are the number of homosexuals, and then you look at the number of people that when marriage was okayed between two men or two women, and you look at the number who took advantage of it and actually went through and got married, there was less than 25% of the conservative numbers of homosexuals. If you were to take what the homosexuals claim, that they're 10 to 12 or 13%, well, then there was probably 1% or less of all homosexuals who take advantage of marriage when it's offered. And you know why? Because, again, I go back that 43% of all homosexuals have 500 or more partners in a lifetime. 28% of them have over 1,000. This is a smokescreen. They're wanting acceptability. They're wanting recognition, and they're wanting some of the, uh, maybe some of the benefits that go along with, you know, being a, a partner of somebody, and they're wanting some of the financial things, but this is a smokescreen that they are committed in their relationships. There may be somebody watching this who comes up and can cite some example of people that have been together for 20 or 30-something years, but I can guarantee you that is the exception rather than the rule. I've also got some other uh, statistics here, if I can find them. Here is the length of current homosexual relationships based on a survey, and this comes from the Gay and Lesbian Consumer Online Census. It was conducted 2003 to 2004, so this is their own information. Somebody might dislike what I'm saying and saying, you're twisting the information. This is the gay and lesbian consumer online census. And the reason they were putting out these negative numbers is to show you how traumatized they are so that you'd feel sorry for them, but it makes a point. Uh, there is 11% of homosexual relationships that have been married for less than a year. There are 31% of all homosexual relationships have been married or... I don't even guess married is the right word. They've been in these relationships for one to three years. There is 29% that have been four to seven years, and 14% have been eight to 11 years. And then beyond 12 years, it goes down to 6%. And for those that have been in a relationship for 20 years or more, there is a total of 5%. In contrast to this, here is a graph that is from the National Center for Health Statistics, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, 2001. And there are 80% of heterosexual marriages that they have been married for five years or less. 66% have been married for 10 years or less. 57% have been married for 15 years or less. And 50% of all heterosexual marriages have been 20 years or more. Now, contrast that with the homosexuals. There are 5% of homosexual relationships that have been together for 20 years or more. So another way of saying this is that homosexuality is 10 times as worse 
as being able to maintain a relationship. Or you could say that the chances of you maintaining a relationship are 10 times better if you go about it in the traditional way that God created rather than trying to do some perversion. This is not good on relationships. It is not normal by anybody's standard except their own. It is just not right. And look at, look at this. Here's another statistic on uh, partner violence. Among homosexuals, uh, lesbians, there is an 11.4% uh, spousal abuse rate among lesbians. Among married women, it's uh, 0.26. In other words, one quarter of 1% is what they claim spousal abuse. That means that among lesbians, that the spousal abuse rate for women is 44 times greater than it is among heterosexual couples. Now, just stop for a moment. Think about all of the women that have been abused and how that there's these helplines and there's these things set up to uh, help abused women. And certainly that's a valid thing. I'm, I, I'm not saying that spousal abuse is good, but I'm saying that among heterosexuals, it is less than 1%, one quarter of 1%. And among lesbians, it's 11.4%, 44 times greater. Now, if people were going to really be honest, and if they were going to apply the truth across the board, they would be down on homosexuality and lesbianism because of the spousal abuse. There's people today that are coming out against marriage because of the spousal abuse that some women suffer. And yet, it's a fraction compared to what goes on in a lesbian relationship. Look at this among homosexual men. There are 15.4% of homosexual men who claim spousal abuse. Among married men, it is 0 0.05. Five hundredths of one percent of men claim that they have been abused by their wife. So that means that among homosexual males, you have a 300 times greater chance of spousal abuse than you do among heterosexuals. Now again, if anybody was wanting to be honest, and if they weren't prejudiced, and if they didn't have an agenda that they were trying to promote, if people were just looking at this, if you could somehow or another take homosexual off of this, and if you were to show that there is some type of behavior that is going to cause 300 times the abuse that happens to the normal population, I guarantee you the people would be on this like a chicken on a June bug. They would be out fighting this. They would be campaigning against this. We've got to stop this. And yet here's homosexuality that by every one of these measurements is damaging and it's not good for you and yet people will be afraid to say anything against it. And if you do say something against it, then they come out against you as this is just your morality, it's your faith position, you have no reason to say this. They are trying to present themselves as absolutely normal in every stretch of the way, except it's just two men or two women. That isn't, that's untrue. The statistics don't bear this out. It's just untrue is all that you can say about it. It's a lie. And they are not accurately representing things. Look at this. It says, um, a new study in the United Kingdom has revealed that homosexuals are about 50% more likely to suffer from depression and engage in substance abuse than the rest of the population, reports health24.com. Now again, if you were to be honest and not biased, if you didn't have a prejudice and some agenda that you were trying to promote, if you found something that caused people to have 50% more depression and substance abuse than the average population. I guarantee you the government would be on this. They would be trying to stop it. They would be outlawing it. They would be promoting this. But you know what? Here it is, homosexuality. And we've got the president of the United States saying that he is trying to get all Americans to accept and to embrace homosexuality, saying that we need to get rid of our outdated ideas and we need to all embrace this. This is a detrimental lifestyle. It is not good. It's destructive. It says, after analyzing 25 earlier studies on sexual orientation and mental health, researchers in a study published in the medical journal 
BMC Psychiatry also found that the risk of suicide jumped over 200% if an individual had engaged in homosexual lifestyle. Now stop and think about that. Boy, again, if we just took the name homosexual off of this, and if you could find something in our society that caused over twice as many suicides among this certain group of people than any other group of people in our society, I guarantee you they would be up in arms. They would be trying to pass legisla legislation. They'd be doing all of this. But because it's homosexuality that causes you to have twice the risk of, of suicide, then they don't say anything about it. And they promote something that is going to increase, double their likelihood of suicide, increase their uh, possibility of depression 50% and substance abuse. That's going to cause all of these problems. And this is just getting a pass because nobody wants to be politically incorrect. Nobody wants to be a hate monger. I tell you, I'm saying these things because I love people. I'm telling you that homosexuality is not only wrong from a scriptural standpoint because God said it was wrong. The reason God said it was wrong is because He loves you. And God doesn't want you destroying your life. God doesn't want you to live with the guilt and the condemnation and the sexually transmitted diseases and the spousal abuse and the depression and the drug abuse and the suicide. God loves you. It's a destructive lifestyle. And that, those are just the facts. And those are only some of the facts. I'm going to have to continue this on our program next Monday. I didn't get through with all of it. But I tell you, this is just what the Word of God has to say. It's wrong. It's what the stats have to say. And people are willingly ignorant of these things. They're, they're intentionally not telling you this stuff. Some people will say, well, it's because of the rejection of the main population that we feel so depressed and suicidal. Well, if that was true, then you could go to Holland where homosexuality has been legalized and been promoted for years. And did you know that the suicide and the depression and the drug abuse rate is statistically identical to the United States where it isn't yet accepted? That, that argument just dies because it can't be proven. If you were to go to a place where it's accepted and even promoted and embraced, well, then it ought to remove all of these things, and it doesn't. The stats are still the same. Homosexuality is wrong. God loves you, but he hates the homosexuality. I encourage you to listen. Our announcer is going to give you information about how you can get this teaching that I've got entitled Christian Philosophy Part 2. You need this. Somebody you know needs this. So please listen and call or write today. Andrew's complete teaching series titled Christian Philosophy Part 2 is available on either CD or on DVD for 13 pounds. The DVDs are made from Andrew's daily television program. Request CD album T1062C or DVD album T1062D when you contact us. The supplemental material Andrew mentioned will also be included with each album. The second teaching in the CD album titled Homosexuality is also available for three pounds. We encourage everyone to give, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this second CD free of charge. Request teaching TCP8C when you write or call, and we'll be pleased to send it to you. We'd like to remind you that Andrew's latest book titled The Believer's Authority is also available for seven pounds. Contact us today to get your copy. I'd like to encourage you to visit our website. We have that address on your screen right now. And you know, on our website, there's a lot of information. All of these stats that I've been giving, we will either have this information there or we'll have a link to other websites where I got this from. But you need to get hold of these truths. And our website is just a tremendous resource to you. There's there's, a, I think, uh, I forget now, but hundreds of my tapes that are there that you can download. There's over 2,000 of my television programs. About six or 7,000 of my radio programs are there. It's a great website. The address is on the screen. I encourage you to check it out and, and be blessed by all of these truths that we're sharing. Visit our website where you can order ministry materials online 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. 
On our website, you'll not only find materials from today's broadcast, you'll find a wealth of resources free for you to download for yourself and share with others. Or you can use your credit card to order by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Our address is AWME, that's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. We hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Budapest, Hungary for a Gospel Truth Seminar October 17th and in Buxton, Derbyshire in England for the Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe Ministers Conference October 19th through the 21st. He'll also be in Karlsruhe, Germany October 23rd through the 25th. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. Anna has a heart to reach the lost, but she needs help getting started. Sean feels a call to the ministry, but he also feels unprepared. Ben and Maggie have been Christians for a long time, but in their golden years, they want a deeper relationship with the Lord. Are you like Anna or Sean or Ben and Maggie? If so, take the next step. Call, write, or go to our website and ask for the Karis Bible College brochure and DVD. Andrew Womack found a Karis Bible College to help you discover your destiny. There is joy and fulfillment awaiting you, the kind that only comes from knowing you are doing what God created you to do. Take that first step today. Call, write, or go to the website and ask about CBC. I'd like to give a special invitation to all of you who are ministers to join me in Buxton, England on October the 19th through the 21st. We're going to have our annual ministers conference there. Bob Yandian from Tulsa, Oklahoma will be ministering with me as well as Charlie and Jill LeBlanc. And I tell you, this is just a special time. We have seen God do some supernatural things in the lives of people during this conference. Three days, October the 19th through the 21st at the Palace Hotel in Buxton, Derbyshire, England. Come and join us and it'll change your life. Tune in Monday for more Gospel Truth. And you feel trapped in it, but I'm telling you, Jesus can set you free. And it's the truth that's going to set you free. And the truth is that God didn't create you to be that way. You can be different.